So we are interested in elementary number theory. So this is what this course is about. So now the word elementary may sound easy, but it's not that it's easy. It is that we are using only techniques which are elementary or algorithmic in nature. For example, we won't use any complex analysis while we are dealing with elementary number theory, right? So our tools and techniques are quote under quote elementary. And again, that doesn't mean it's easy, okay? So um, before we start, uh, this is a quote by one of the uh, one of the old or the founding fathers of of uh, of number theory. Uh, this is Carl Frederick Gauss. So he said basically the following. Let me uh, tell you the translation. Mathematics is king of of sciences, and Zalin theory, which is number theory, is the king of mathematics. Okay. So so this was a quote by. Gauss, and it is actually uh, well recognized in mathematical um, community that this is indeed the case. All right. So, second quote, uh, which is by an unknown person, is sometimes the end justifies the beginning. All right. And in this case, uh, you will see how the end justifies the beginning in the sense that at the end of this course, you will have enough tools to understand more of problems. Uh, uh, of number theory, okay? So here are a few uh, courses, a few, here are the few problems which are interesting uh, in nature. So, uh, so, so this is a, a, what is called as Beale's conjecture. Of course, we are not going to solve it. I mean, like, there's a $1 million prize if you can solve it. Uh, it says the following, if you look at the equation, x to the p, plus y to the p, y to the q, my bad, equals to z to the power r. And if you're looking for integer, non-zero integer solutions, uh, there are no non-zero integer solutions uh, for basically p and q and r as integers, which are greater than or equal to three, and x, y, z are co-prime, pairwise co-prime integers. What does it mean by pairwise co-prime? Pairwise co-prime means basically, if you look at x, y, GCD of this is one, GCD of y, z is one, GCD of x, z. So if you look at pairwise, they have no common factors greater than one, okay? So a special case, so, so Beale's conjecture, of course, it's still open. Uh, but uh, the reason for mentioning that Beale's conjecture here is the following, this expression, the, the, the statement of the, this conjecture is completely elementary number theoretic, right? You are basically using no fancy tools except for definition of integers really to define this problem or conjecture. Now, if you look at special case, when P equals to Q equals to R, you basically are an equals to two, you are in the scenario of what? x squared plus y squared equals to z squared. Now that is a Pythagoras theorem and you can find infinitely many, infinitely many solutions Yeah, studying Pythagoras triplets is also, so these X, Y, Z are called Pythagoras triplets. X, Y, Z are called Pythagoras, named after Pythagoras triplets. Okay, there are infinitely many of them. There are few primitive ones from which you can construct a lot more. Okay, so the whole, uh, uh, even for this case, it's interesting. All right. For P equals to Q equals to R equals to three. This was called Fermat's last theorem. Yeah. And Fermat basically, when he presented this problem, he said in his column that the, the solu uh, he has a solution to this problem, which is elementary, but doesn't, his column width is not big enough to include that. Uh, however, when you look at the proof of this, 
uh, it was solved by Andrew Wiles, who was a British mathematician, uh, perhaps spent all of his lifetime trying to solve this problem and took a considerable chunk of his time, like at least 10 years or so. Uh, and he uses a lot of fancy machinery to solve this problem. So he used what is called as a modularity theorem for elliptic curves. So the idea is elliptic curves are, are basically related to something called as modular forms. And uh, every elliptic curve has a modular form. And then you try to get some kind of contradiction if this has a solution to that statement. All right. So of course, this is again, not part of our course. Uh, you can study more of it in algebraic number theory but the statement comes from the elementary number theory, all right? Algebraic number theory is another aspect of, of, or another branch of number theory where you use slightly more fancier concepts uh, from number theory, okay? You use algebra, you use field extensions and all those things, uh, okay? Now, third problem is also very interesting. So, so far, at least as it looks like, these two problems may not have any application but look at third problem. So given a prime P, you basically an X, Y greater than or equal to two, which are less than P, find K such that what K, so you're given X and Y as well. You want to find the power such that X to the power K is Y mod P. If you think about it, essentially what you're trying to find is you're trying to find log of Y base X. Right? It's not really the log because you have a discrete version of log here, right? Because you're going mod P, yeah? So this is what is called discrete log problem. So given X and Y uh, following this, and you know, you want to find out what power of X gives you Y mod P, right? So our whole crypto system, so a lot of crypto system is based on this. So there is RSA, which is some kind of variant of it. Uh, the elliptic curve is also based on discrete log problem, but in a different group. Yeah, it's in a group of uh, elliptic curves. Elliptic curves themselves, the points on elliptic curve form a group, and you can use the same thing on any group, essentially. But for now, uh, for us, if you look at RSA, is is the, the security of RSA is, is loosely based on discrete log problem. Okay, so that's another avenue people can, can can, can look into this problem. So discrete log cannot be solved efficiently. Uh, that means there's no polynomial time algorithm to, to do the discrete log, okay? So this is an application based uh, aspect of it. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, one more thing then. Uh, few more questions we can ask. Uh, now forgetting about whether they are, um, fancy or not, or, or whether they are applicable or not, is pi to the power e rational? Yeah, is this sum of this series is rational? I mean, of course, you know that this series is convergent because of P series test. And the question is, if it converges to some value, is that value rational or irrational? Yeah. So again, this is, these are open problems. Okay, this is open, this guy is open. Uh, Fermat's last theorem was proved. Of course, that's why it's called theorem. Discrete log is a problem, but is there an algorithmic efficient polynomial time algorithm? The answer is no. Now, there are a few things we'll study in this course. Uh, one is about Ditchless theorem. So if I tell you pi, can you find a number which is close enough to pi? Yeah, you will of course tell me that, oh, pi is roughly 3.14. Yeah, and I agree with that but that is up to two decimal places, right? So can you find a good enough approximation, a rational approximation for a given real number, all right? So that is what is the Dirichlet approximation uh, theorem. Then there are a few more examples. Uh, the few more problems which are interesting is the congruent number problem. So if you take a natural number N, the question is, is there a right angle triangle with a rational side? So if I give you natural number n, so given n, can you find a right angle triangle with rational sides, means basically x and y are the sides, and z, such that what happens, such that n equals to 
2 times x y sorry n equals to half times x y right because you want to present n as the area of this right angle triangle so this is what it's asking right again this these these problems are hard problems they are open okay then there is catalan catalan's theorem it says basically the following uh, So then there's Catalan's theorem, which says that the only consecutive powers of natural numbers are three, eight and nine, all right? That means it's asking, are there consecutive powers? So it's saying basically, is there, is there X to the M and Y to the M such that X to the M equals to Y to the M plus one, something of this sort, right? And it says, well, yes, that is only true when X is nine and M is, sorry x is nine and y is eight what what am i saying x is uh, three y is two right so these are the only consecutive powers of natural numbers okay so this was catalan's theorem it was a very old theorem it was only proved in 2002 okay so so on the list can go on and on and on all right so So let's start with the course now. So this is the machinery. So let's develop some machinery for the course, right? I mean, some tools or some language after which we will be able to approach the whole thing. So the set of natural numbers is given by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So this is a set of natural numbers. Set of integers is constructed out of natural numbers by including zero and the negatives. Then the set of rational numbers is basically take one integer, divide by another integer. You just want to make sure that you do not divide by zero. Now, the set of construction of real numbers is more interesting. Uh, you have to do an analysis course to, to really understand that. Or you can read very briefly about the equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences. That will give you a set of R. Or you can look at, look at Dedekind's cut. Or you can also look at uh, continued fraction to understand uh, the the construction of real numbers. But real numbers is not really much of our concern at the moment. Okay. So, uh, however, we have an intuitive understanding of it and we'll fall back to it. But everything else will define properly. Okay. So we call a number, a real number rational. If that number can be written in a form of P divided by Q, where P and Q both are integers and Q is not zero. And if this number is not rational, then we say we call it irrational, all right? So there is a usual uh, chain of inclusion. Uh, the inclusion being, you can see that natural number is contained inside the integers, which is contained inside Q which is contained inside R, which is contained inside C, and then they, yeah. So, so this is a containment. Um, yeah, it does look like Math 242 a bit for now. Now, uh, the set of natural numbers, so our focus is mostly natural numbers, and by slight extension integers. Uh, so set of natural numbers is equipped with the following property. The property is that if you take any non-empty subset of positive integers, you will always find a least element. Yeah, so let's take any subset of positive, like say just randomly throw some bunch of two, three, five, nine, twenty, blah, blah, blah. You'll always find what? You'll always find a least element, which is say for example, in this case, the least element is here. Yeah, so this is what is called as well-ordering principle. Now, so we'll use well-ordering principle soon. So let's move to the concept of divisibility now. Okay, so again, the definition is very important, all right? So what does it mean by divisibility? So let A and B be two integers.
and then we say a divides b or a is a divisor of b or b is divisible by a if there exist c which is also an integer so c in z such that what such that you get b equals to a so this is the definition of divisibility all right and you do not go you 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 there's nothing like saying oh it divides evenly or something like that this is the precise definition of divisibility all right and this is the definition you need to use when you're discussing about things okay so okay so now the notation is notation for this same statement is that you put a divides b and if a does not divides b you say a does not divides b so this is for a divides b and this symbol is for a a does not divide So this is the, the definition of divisibility, all right? So now there are a few properties of divisibility we should look at. How do we prove this? So the way to prove this is the following. So A divides B implies there exist, this is symbol for there exist, K belonging to Z such that what such that a k equals to b right so you can call it k1 k1 similarly a divides c this implies what there exist k2 belonging to z such that what a k2 equals to c yeah this is the definition of divisibility right so now you want to show what about bx plus cy right so let's take bx plus cy then it's going to be bx so it's going to be a k1 x plus a k2 y you can take a out you have k1 x plus k2 y now what do we have we have k1x plus k2y belong to z right so why is that since k1 x y and k2 belong to z so therefore this belongs to z so this implies this statement itself implies what so if you look at this statement it will imply that a divides bx plus y. So this is a proof of this statement. Okay. Yeah, you would have seen this statement. So you may be wondering, this statement, you would have seen it in your Macam 101 if you did that course. If you did not do that course, that's that's better. But if you have done that course, you would have seen this there, but we'll go slightly more interesting as the time proceeds further. All right, so a few more things uh, about divisibility. Uh, so um, another one, so proposition one, proposition two, if A divides B and B divides C, then this implies A divides C, right? So that is not difficult to, to see, right? Um, okay, uh, all right, so third, if A divides B and B divides A, what can you say about A and B? This implies what? Anyone? This should imply, okay. So, so there are statements, so P, so let 
P and Q to be statements. Okay. So statement means that means P can be can have can have only one logical mara kitna faltu saman mein kis pada okay mara bas kitna faltu saman pada so guys uh, now so we have the following so if you have p so p a statement if i give you a mathematical uh, a statement a logical statement it can either have it can have only one of these values it can either be true or it can either be false right so when you write about p there's are the only two possibilities for p okay so that what constitutes to a logical statement now there is we can talk about negative of that statement so it's called this is called not p it's a negation of p so when p is true negation of p will be false and when p is false the negation of that will be true right so think about it like a lot of whatever mathematical problems we are solving basically arise out of these statements really right so think about it say let's say square root of 2 is a irrational number that is a statement and that statement is basically true yeah or 6 is a so or statement like this 6 is a prime number that is a statement logical statement and that statement has a value false so this is what we do in 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 mathematics usually uh we try to so we break it down to these individual statements and try to understand them okay so few more things so that is not now suppose you want to basically understand two statements together suppose you have statement p and statement q and you want to combine two statements because not everything is an atomic statement atomic statement is basically it comes out of one so out of this atomic statement we are combining them to basically make a more complicated so one is conjunction so let's read it the following so p p r q and p and q so this is read as p r q and this is read as p and q so now we want to consider two statements together p and q now there is not just two possibilities there are more than two possibilities so the possibilities are if p is true then you can have your q to be either true or q could be either false right similarly if you have p to be false or f then q to be q can be either true or it can be false okay let me fill the statement like f sorry t t f f so you see the reason why we have four because that represents all the possibilities of p and q taken together all right so when you say p or q you are basically seeing when is either one of them true and if that is true then the statement p or q would be true so in this case you will see that this is going to be true or so this is going to be true because one of them is true this is true and this is what this is what this is false okay when you're looking at p and q you're looking at both of them to be true so p and q here you will have t no both of them are not true both of them are not true so both of them are not true so false false so then there is an implication operator so p implies q does one logical statement implies the other logical statement 
So if this is true and this is true, it's going to be true. The only time it is false when true implies false, otherwise it's always true. Okay, so these are the logical operators. Now, um, so there are a few more things to consider. Now note the following, say, um, let's All right, so the next theorem I want to discuss is basically a theorem on division algorithm. So division algorithm. So division algorithm tells you the following. If you take if a it's about dividing right a and b are integers such that b is greater than zero then there exist unique integers q and r such that a equals to bq plus r with if r is zero then b divides so the possibility is that r can be zero right then b divides a or if it is non-zero then it is bounded above by b so in some sense what you're doing is you are dividing so in some sense you're dividing dividing what dividing a by b and that's why you want b to be non-zero you don't have the concept of dividing by zero really uh, so dividing a by b so and the quotient is quotient is q and remainder is r yeah if you recall uh, 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 that you can also have uh, a is what dividend and b is what b is is uh, a what b is a divisor yeah this is just a nomenclature of it like naming of things so that it's clear what they are so let's prove this theorem. I mean, you have been using this theorem since I don't know when. I mean, like, you know, let's take an example just to make it clear. Say, let's say 43 divided by seven. So 43 equals to what? Seven times, uh, what? Seven times uh, six plus three, right? So you're dividing here. So you start with A equals to 43, B equals to seven then you have what a equals 43 equals to 7 times 6 plus what those no, 7 is 42 42 plus 1 not 3 <laughs> okay yeah 6 7 the 42 42 plus 1 and clearly your 1 is basically what it's basically bigger than or equal to 0 and less than what what you're dividing with which is 7 okay so this is what the division algorithm is all right uh, it is unique only because you're imposing this r has to be between what zero and and b all right so let me look at question it's not an algorithm even though it's called the division algorithm it's not giving you any method of finding q 
and R. But this claim is telling you that if you take A and B, two integers, and at the back of your mind, you're dividing A by B, then you can find unique Q and R such that A equals to B Q plus R. Okay. So let's try to prove this. So proof of this. So in this case, your Q, first of all, is six and your R is one. So proof of this proof. Again, what do I want to show when I say proof? I want to show that there exist this Q and R one. So I want to show that there exist Q and R, which is here. And not only that, I want to show that they are also unique. All right. So these are the these are the goals of this proof. So let's look at the following. So let's take S to be set of all integers. Next K, such that K belongs to Z. And so let's consider this set. All right. So, so to consider this set, now we are going to use the following. So you take T, So not only that, you, so basically here you have 